These points will lead us in to this particular crater. And we hope to evaluate the lighting conditions there so that when we come back, we can explain to the people who will have to make a landing, perhaps at this landing site itself, just what the same to me. Well, that's right. It, this, actually, this picture is a little bit too blown up. There's, it's very easy, though, I think, and if I'm mistaken, uh, I'm going to be surprised. But this area here is very similar to uh, land water. You can see Baja, California very easily. It stood out quite a bit. This is Amari, or a sea, the Sea of Tranquility. These are the Pyrenees Mountains over here. Right off the map is a half-hidden crater called Masculine B, which is very prominent as we come over. The rill, or the cut in the, in the ground uh, down here, is quite prominent. The triangular mountain with the crater on top is very prominent. These are our two initial points. And we'll merely come across there. We will time it, then, from the second IP, right on through to see this crater. Now, this crater is about 2,000 feet in diameter. And if you put four of them together, it's about the length of the runway at Ellington Air Force Base, which, which I'm quite familiar with. This crater is also halfway between the crater Masculine B, a big one, and the Pyrenees Mountains over here. There are other very significant things. Look at these triplet craters right through here, point directly towards the crater. It's also part of a triangle right through there. So I hope that uh, with any luck at all, unless I go blind on the flight somehow, that we'll be able to pick out that particular crater. You already talk like you've flown it and have seen it. Yeah, this area has become quite familiar to me. I, I almost know it, uh, uh, well, I do. I know it quite well. Jim Lovell, who knows it quite well. He hadn't been to it before, but such is the study and the training of these astronauts that he felt he did. And as you heard, both when Lovell and Anders, as they made their first pass around the moon, they were calling out the sights they were seeing below as if they were skilled uh, guides at the Washington Monument. Uh, they know the area so well. But now the photography, and it's not quite as simple as it might seem from here on Earth. I wonder if out at Downey, California, the North American rock will bilst out and uh, Leo Krupp might tell us what's involved in this navigation and uh, tracking and picture taking. Walter, first of all, as you can see in this exterior shot of the Apollo that we have here at North American Rockwell, first of all, the windows are pretty well spread around, and the last reports we heard, perhaps you have later information, indicated that that earlier fogging, icing problem on the windows uh, had begun to clear up, so that perhaps now the astronauts have a pretty clear shot through whichever window they want to use. Now, I'm in Bill Anders' seat, and I'll be using one kind of camera. He earlier used the television camera. Uh, Leo is in Borman's seat, and uh, Frank Borman will be using the motion picture camera. How does that one work, uh, Leo, and how good is it? Well, Bill, this is the 16-millimeter uh, movie camera, and uh, it can be used inside to take movies of the crew movements around the cockpit. And also, for shooting out the window, we have a right-angle mirror, which adapts to the front of the camera, like so. It allows us to shoot in this direction and take a picture and it it snaps onto a bracket up here on my window like so mm -hmm. and i'm i'll be now taking uh, photographs along the x-axis of the vehicle out straight ahead of the nose almost a periscope effect that's right it is a, a periscope they they also have walter uh, the hasselblad that we've heard about again and again and that's this kind of camera it uses a piece of film that's 70 millimeters wide exactly twice that of most of the strip film cameras that people are familiar with. It also has a set of filters. Uh, this one is the red filter. There's a blue. You may have heard the astronauts talking with Houston and Mission Control about those earlier. Uh, our people uh, who deal with pictures on a more technical basis than I do say that the different filters are to cut out different rays, uh, different kinds of haze. And Anders will use this. This is a battery pack, incidentally, on the bottom. It's a power-driven camera. Anders will use this, either out the hatch up here or there, uh, to take a series at rather high speed of pictures of the ground, in effect a strip photograph. They'll put these together, he'll take pictures on perhaps two different orbits, and put these together to receive a, a stereoptic effect. Perhaps the best, uh, most detailed, most accurate feel that anyone has ever had of what the surface of the moon is like what those rills and rays and craters really look like through a high-quality camera such as this. This has an 80-millimeter lens, and it's a very good machine indeed. 
Those, of course, are the pictures we won't see until sometime after the people get back to Earth. There's also the television camera in here that perhaps we can take out of its mount and give you some idea how that works. There's a, a trigger that loosens it. And these are the pictures we've been seeing in live transmission from Apollo. This is a remarkable piece of equipment. It has two lenses. Which one is that uh, at this point, Leo? Uh, this is the wide-angle lens. Uh, the long lens is the telephoto is this one here. That's this the one that didn't work earlier when they were trying to take a shot of the Earth. Mm -hmm. This bracket comes off here if you want to use it as a handheld, but uh, if you're going to mount it in the places that are provided around the cockpit, you'd leave this mounting bracket on, then you could mount the camera in a rigid, uh, rigid mount. You wouldn't have to hold it by hand. Really an amazing instrument, the way they were able to pass it back and forth across the cabin, uh, use it in one window or the other, and receive orders from the ground about uh, taking a somewhat different shot. All that with a piece of cable and a camera. Think what we put up with, trying to get television out of our spacecraft. Right? There's one more complexity to this. There is a cable that hooks on here and goes around and plugs in underneath your knees there. And I think in one movie you saw the, the cable floating around the cockpit. Now, yes. we're, we're using it without the cable in here. No, I think it was Anders we saw, uh, fighting the cable out of the way like so much clothesline in a high wind, finally getting it under control. But all that, Walter, is the machinery that's going to provide the raw material for thousands of feet of film and thousands of stills that all of us are going to wait for with a great deal of anticipation in the days ahead. You know, Bill, you're talking about that uh, cable floating free. Uh, we've really gotten a little bit blasé here on Earth about space travel. We used to talk so much about the weightless character of space flight during Mercury and Gemini. Now, here are these fellows uh, living six days out there, going to the moon, weightless during the entire period, fighting the business of everything floating. It's not, not only a matter of fighting, sometimes they're benefited by it, as we've seen in space. Uh, they can just uh, put the, their food out there in, in the middle of the cabin, uh, in what would be uh, the middle of space in the cabin, and just sits there. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, talking about those pictures, uh, we might go out to JPL now and ask Dr. Shoemaker, uh, who's uh, been up several times this morning to explain details of the moon, just uh, what they are looking for on the moon in the series of pictures they'll be taking and in their landmark tracking experiments, that is, their visual tracking landmarks. There is quite a variety of terrain. Uh, perhaps uh, we could start at one end of this orbit, uh, Dr. Shoemaker, and move along and, and see what they're looking for. Right. Well, if we can go directly to the map here, and uh, we see part of the map of the back side of the moon and the pencil moving along the trace of the orbit, starting at the extreme limb on the back side. Uh, and this area will be in the dark, and some photographs will be attempted uh, in the dark just to see what the level of illumination is on the moon. But of course, there's no sunlight, uh, no sunlight and no earth light striking this particular part. Now, when we reach the point where the pencil is just at now, in this region, uh, the sun is coming up and is rising as seen from the spacecraft. And there are several very interesting phenomena that are to be photographed right at this point. One of them has to do with the sun and the atmosphere of glaring gases, the solar corona that extends out from the sun. These are basically astronomical measurements and photographs that can be taken of a region that's not normally not photographed at all from the uh, Earth. Uh, in addition, there's an opportunity to look for a bright line along the horizon of the moon, which may indicate the presence of an atmosphere so to speak, of small solid particles, perhaps particles bouncing around on the moon. Now as we progress on from the sunrise line, we come into the region that's illuminated directly by sunlight, and this is the area where the astronauts can photograph targets of opportunity, different interesting features uh, near the orbital path, both directly beneath it and off to each side, uh, unusual features that we'd like to have good close-ups uh, for. In addition to these targets of opportunity, Pictures will be taken along the sunlit portion uh, in co a continuous strip of pictures with stereoscopic overlap, which will enable us then to uh, map out this strip topographically in detail. So by this, we'll be learning more about the sun, too, in this voyage. Yes, indeed. We'll learn something about the sun. We'll learn more about the detailed shapes of the moon's surface. And we may just possibly get the confirming evidence on either the presence or the absence 
of a, of a cloud or atmosphere of small solid particles above the moon's surface. One controversy, certainly, uh, the age of the moon. And is it going to tell us about the Earth because it's uh, older than we are? Well, what's your feeling on it? Well, our most recent evidence on the age of the moon is based on the rate at which meteorites and other solid objects are hitting the moon. My best estimates now indicate that most parts of the moon's surface are in fact younger than the moon and younger than the Earth as, as bodies. In other words, we may not see the record preserved on the surface of the first billion years of history that Robert Jastrow spoke of earlier this morning. Uh, it looks as though much of the moon's surface is young, uh, not quite as young as the average uh, part of the Earth's surface, but still too young to give us these critical early clues about the first stages of formation of bodies in the solar system that we once hoped uh, it would give. 